Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, I want to thank in a very special way uh, Father Michael and Father Zach for inviting me to these 40 hours. Uh, Father Michael said I can speak as long as I want, um, but it's not going to be 40 hours. But if you notice the flyer, um, tomorrow you got the big wig coming, uh, the president of uh, Franciscan University at Steubenville. And I noticed he got his picture on the flyer. <laughs> they only put the good looking ones on the flyer, but uh, hopefully uh, I feel kind of like the warm up band for him. But what I want to focus on tonight is um, really a Franciscan themes during these time of the Eucharist and focus on St. Francis, St. Clair, and St. Anthony. You know, Francis is an interesting character. You know his story, how he was very rich when he was young. His father wanted him to be rich and famous. He thought he was going to be a knight. He goes off to war, gets thrown in jail, comes back a loser, and was really struggling what he wanted to do. And he went to a broken down church called San Damiano and knelt in front of a crucifix just like this one. And he pleaded, God, please help me. Help me. What am I supposed to do? He was seeking direction in his life. And we know tradition has it that Jesus became alive on the cross and spoke to Francis's heart that said, go rebuild my church that you see is falling into ruin. And so Francis said, that's it, that's my answer. I'll be a construction worker. And so he went out and he got the bricks, he got the rocks, he got the, uh, the mortar, and he started to physically rebuild the church. But then he realized something else was, was going on in his heart. And ultimately he realized that the Lord wanted him to rebuild the church, not physically, but rather to rebuild the church simply by living the gospel life. The gospel life, that's what Francis wanted. And he started to attract more and more followers. Thousands of men came to follow Jesus in the way of St. Francis. There's many stories of Francis, but my favorite story is the time that he was walking along the road and he comes upon a leper. And we know that in the biographies of Francis, they would always say that he hated lepers. It said he made him you know, want to throw up because of the sight and the smell. And the lepers would live at the bottom of Assisi. Assisi is on a, on a mountain. And so the rich would live up top, and the poorer you got, the farther down you would live. Because they didn't have plumbing those days, but the plumbing stuff would run down into the valley. And that's where the lepers lived. And so Francis, on a journey one day, comes upon a leper. And he had to make a decision. Do I run away? or do I do something else? And he did that something else. He went over and he embraced the leper and the leper disappeared for the leper was Christ. Francis said, that is what we're gonna do. We're gonna reach out to those that no one else wants to deal with. We're gonna reach out to the margins. We're gonna reach out to the poorest of the poor. And I think as we begin this season of Lent, we can ask ourselves, who are the lepers in our life? Who are the people that drive us crazy? Who are the people that when you see their name on your cell phone, you hit no, or whatever it says on that. I'm not getting it. We have them, and they might be in our own families, but maybe we're called, we're challenged to embrace them because we'll find Christ. Franciscan spirituality can be summed up in the three C's, the three C's, the crib, the cross, and the ciborium. All three go together. And so the crib. We know that Francis was overjoyed with the incarnation. He couldn't believe that God would leave his royal throne and be born among us as one of us in a poor stable. And Francis of Assisi is the first one to start the first nativity scene in a little town called Greccio in Italy because he wanted a place in front of the people's eyes what it was like that first Christmas night of the poverty of Jesus Christ. And the cross, he loved to look at the cross. Wherever he would go, he would take sticks and make the sign of the cross and meditate on the cross because on the cross, he saw Jesus open his arms and give his all for all of us. Francis wanted to imitate Jesus Christ perfectly. And so he gave up everything he had and gave it to the poor he reached out to the poor, 
But one day when he was praying on top of a mountain, meditating on the cross, a seraph, an angel flew over him and imprinted on his hands, his feet, and his side the marks of the crucifixion. And so Francis is the first saint in the history of the church to receive the sacred stigmata. And Francis looked like Jesus Christ. And finally, Francis said, yes, the incarnation, yes, the cross, but it's the, the, the ciborium, the Eucharist. And they probably pick ciborium because it doesn't make sense if you go CCE. But anyway, it's the Eucharist. And so you look, Francis said, you look to the Eucharist because there is Jesus Christ, the real presence. And Francis had a great devotion, a great devotion to the Eucharist. We always think that in the Middle Ages, the people had a wonderful devotion to the Eucharist. But maybe true in, in one sense, but in another sense, not really. The priests at that time were living horrible lives. The religious weren't being religious, and the people were going their own way. And so the church really was falling into ruin. And I always say, we think we have scandals in our church today. We're nothing compared to the time of Francis. And so Francis, rebuilding the church, he wanted to focus on the Eucharist because he said it's that Eucharist that we stand upon. It's that Eucharist that will give us the strength. And Francis, he would love to clean churches. He would go to different churches and sweep them. Why? Because the Eucharist was there. The presence of Jesus was there, and he said it needs to be clean. And Francis, he didn't want anything for himself. He just wore tattered clothes. But he said the Eucharist and the churches should be beautifully adorned because of the presence of Jesus Christ right there. And he challenged his priests where he said, um, you know, priests, be careful when you celebrate mass. Be careful with every little detail. And he said, priests should realize that the chalices, corporals, and altar linens where the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ are offered and sacrificed should be completely suitable. And he spoke of the scandals of the priests who reserved the blessed sacrament in unsuitable places or carry it about irreverently or receive it unworthily or give it to all comers without distinction. Francis challenged his friar priests to celebrate worthily and to know what is happening and to know who you carry, Jesus Christ. Francis didn't do a whole lot of writing in his time. Uh, unlike you know, the, the great saints of Dominic or, or Augustine, he just wrote some letters that we have. But looking at those letters, we can find his true spirit of his love for the Eucharist. In his letter to the faithful, to the people of Assisi, he said, all those who refuse to do penance and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ are blind because they cannot see the true light, our Lord Jesus Christ. Francis says you need to be humble to receive our Lord and go to confession. Now, I realize that for many of us, we'd rather get a root canal than go to confession. But Francis said, no, you need to open your heart, open your soul to the grace of Jesus Christ so you can worthily receive our Eucharist. And so during Lent, we have that opportunity to go to confession. Maybe we haven't been in a while. Maybe we say, I didn't do anything wrong. Francis challenges us that if we're going to be Eucharistic people, we need to be people of reconciliation reconciliation with our God. And we see that Francis would say, he, we, where he tells his friars, we should visit churches often and show great reverence for the clergy, not just for them personally, for they may be sinners, but because of their high office, for it is they who administer the most holy body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Francis very easily could have pointed fingers and said, look at those priests, they're not living a good life. But he tells the friars and he tells the people, respect them, respect them, because it is through their hands we receive our Lord Jesus Christ. Certainly priests are sinners. You have wonderful priests here. Father Michael and Father uh, Zach stand on the shoulders of Monsignor Luca and uh, Father Dennis. But there's some places that they don't like their priests and they start to murmur about them and, and gossip. 
and say, oh, look at how they're living. Francis says, wait a minute, put the brakes on. Do not necessarily look at their sins, but rather respect them for what the Lord has chosen them to do. For it is through them that we receive our Lord Jesus Christ. It may surprise many people that St. Francis was never ordained a priest. He was ordained a deacon. And a lot of the scholars will wonder, well, why didn't he become a priest? And it goes back to the fact that maybe he just was too humble. He didn't think he was worthy to become, uh, become a priest. None of us are. But Francis really took it uh, deeply into his soul. But we're told that he would try to attend Mass at least once a day and to receive our Lord with such devotion. And Francis, they consider also one of the great poets in the Italian language. His Canticle of Creatures, where he talks about Brother Sun and Sister Moon, it's still studied today in the schools of, uh, of Italy because it's the first real great uh, poetry in the Italian language. But Francis, again, he loved to reflect on the Eucharist, and he says this about the Eucharist. O sublime humility, O humble sublimity, that the Lord of the whole universe, God and the Son of God, should humble himself like this and hide under the form of a little bread for our salvation. I don't usually watch EWTN, sometimes I do so I can steal a homily or two, but I don't know if they still do it, but they used to have at the very, very beginning of um, the mass where they had the incense flowing and uh, I think the, there was a chalice and Jesus's blood was going into the chalice. They would say this, they would say this prayer, O sublime humility, O humble sublimity, that the Lord of the whole universe, God and the Son of God, should humble himself like this and hide under the form of a little bread for our salvation. Francis realized that it took great humility for our Lord to come among us in the simple, ordinary pieces of bread. And so Francis was able to worship and receive our Lord in the simple, ordinary pieces of bread. And then he was moved to action, to go and find Jesus in the simple, ordinary people, in the lepers, in his friars, in the people that no one else wanted to deal with. And that, I think, is our challenge as we begin 40 hours. We come, we reflect, we adore our Lord, and then the Lord says, you recognize me on the altar, now go out and recognize me in the person sitting next to you, in the people that no one else wants to deal with, in those people that drive us crazy, in our husband, our wives, our children. Go and see my presence there. Francis had one final thing when he wrote um, an admonition that people would read and, and try to, to gain strength from. And Francis said this about Jesus' presence in the Blessed Sacrament. Jesus shows himself to us in this sacred bread, just as he once appeared to his apostles in real flesh. With their own eyes, they saw only flesh, but they believed that he was God because they contemplated him with the eyes of the Spirit. We too, with our own eyes, see only bread and wine, but we must see further and firmly believe that this is his most holy body and blood, living and true. In this way, our Lord remains continually with his followers as he promised, Behold, I am with you even to the end of time. And so the Eucharist is really the foretaste of heaven for all of us, that we're never closer to heaven than when we are at the, at the altar and receive our Lord. There the Lord promises he's with us now and will continue to be with us forever in heaven. And so Francis of Assisi had that great love for the Eucharist, and he challenges all of us to have the same. The most beautiful woman in Assisi was a woman by the name of Claire. And Claire came from a very rich family, and her father wanted her to, to marry rich. But Claire was enamored with Francis. She would hear him preach, she saw him how he lived, how he lived very simply, and she wanted to follow him. 
But the problem was she was a woman and there's no female friars. But Francis said, come, join us and we will find a place for you. So one Palm Sunday night, Claire snuck out of her house, walked clear across the city of Assisi, down into a valley where there was a little church where the friars were praying and waiting for her. And at that time, Francis went and she had beautiful blonde hair and he cut off her hair as a symbol of her devotion to the Lord. And we still have that hair uh, in Assisi in a, in a gold case. But Claire, at that point, started what we call today the Poor Clares, a contemplative order. If you ever go to the Shrine of St. Anthony, you'll see a beautiful statue of St. Clair. And it's St. Clair dressed in her Franciscan habit, holding a cross, the outline of the San Damiano cross, and she's behind it, symbolizing that she was a contemplative. She never left the monastery but stayed there and prayed with the sisters. Claire, too, had a wonderful devotion to the Blessed Sacrament. And there's one great story that one night the, the Saracens were coming in to invade Assisi, to destroy the town, and they got to San Damiano, which was the little church where the poor Claire's, Claire was, was living. And Claire at this time was very, very sick, probably because of the incredible fasting that she would do, um, their diet was very, very, very simple. Uh, there's also a great story about, about her diet and bread. The day that Francis of Assisi was being canonized, the Pope came and visited Claire, and he came for lunch, and all they were going to have was stale bread and water. And the Pope said to Claire, bless this bread. And she said, no, no, you're the Pope, you bless it. No, no, you're in charge, you're the abbess, bless the bread. And so Claire said a prayer over the stale bread. And as she made the sign of the cross over the stale bread, crosses formed on each one of the pieces of bread. Hot cross buns today. That's the beginning of it. It's true. So when you go over to Harris Teeter, you can continue, get your hot cross buns and think of St. Clair. Don't ask me about the candied fruit. I have no idea how that got in. But really, that's the beginning of it. And so even in the simple bread, it was a foretaste of the Eucharist. But France, or Claire, here come these, this army to attack her, and they, and they breached the, the monastery wall. And the sisters were scared to death, and they went to her, Claire, Claire, help, help. And Claire was so sick, she was able to get out of bed, though. And she told the sisters, bring me a little box. And in the little box was the host. And she took that little box and placed it right at the edge of the monastery, and like Esther, who we heard in our first reading today, she prostrated in front of the, of the host. And she said, Jesus, please, you got to help us. Protect your handmaidens. She had no power on her own, but she le believed in the power of the Eucharist. And then after she prayed, there was a little voice that came in her ear that said, I will take care of you. I will always protect you. And then she said, my Lord, please, if it is your wish, protect also this city, which is sustained by your love. When the soldiers saw that, they were so impressed and filled with awe that she would give her entire self to our Lord in the Eucharist that they all fled in fear. Sometimes when you see a statue of St. Clair, she's holding a monstrance, which is, a, a, they probably didn't have monstrances back then, but she's holding a monstrance uh, symbolizing that story, that she believed in the power of the Eucharist, that it could even scare away the evil men. We can learn from Claire. We can earn, learn from Claire that this Eucharist, who we will adore for the next 40 hours, has power, a power of love, a power that we can trust in, a power that we can go to. And finally, the last uh, Franciscan, St. Anthony of Padua, um, he too had a great devotion to the Eucharist. And Anthony felt very sorry for heretics. He said, these poor heretics, you know, they're missing, on the, missing out on everything, especially the Eucharist. And he said, you know, no one can survive long without that spiritual nourishment of Holy Communion. You may know this story uh, because it's the big statue when you come on the... Uh, at the shrine, but 
a heretic came up to Anthony and said, I'm not go I can't believe in the real presence of Jesus isn't really there. He said, if my donkey bows before the Eucharist, I will believe. So Francis said, well, I'll take you up. And so Francis said, don't feed your donkey for three days. I will go to the woods and I will pray for three days. Then you come with its food and I will bring Jesus in the blessed sacrament. Sure enough, the three days, people gathered. They wanted to see what was going to happen with this heretic. Here comes the donkey, bypasses the food, and bows before Jesus in the blessed sacrament. Anthony said, you know, if a jackass can get it, so can you. And so he challenged them. He challenged them. He says, even the material, even the created animals understand. And we're told that that heretic converted and became a great follower of Jesus. And so my sisters and brothers, over these next 40 hours, we know that we'll be in the presence of Jesus Christ, the presence of Jesus who loves us so much, who invites us to seek, to ask, as we heard in the gospel today. Come to him with your whole heart. Bow before him. Bring him whatever hurt you have, whatever trouble you have, with the anxieties and maybe fear of the future. Bring it to Jesus. And through the intercession of Francis and Claire and Anthony, may we truly know the humble Lord who humbles himself to come among us in a simple piece of bread. But we know his presence is anything but simple, but powerful love given for all.